1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11. And the men of Israel went out unto Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it in between Mespeh and Shen, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. I've called this message this morning, The Importance of Building Memorials. The Importance of Building Memorials. The only time that believers are actually exhorted in Scripture to look back is to remember the faithfulness of God in history. Um, it's also uh, to, to remember His achievements on our behalf and also His promises and His, pro his provision and His protection for us as the people of God in the past. Um, every other exhortation and Scripture seems to look forward. Um, scripture generally is saying, like, don't look back. A lot of times it's like, don't look back. And probably a verse that covers that or epitomizes that as much as any is uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, which says this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth on to those things which are before. Now the question we could ask is, is the Bible contradicting itself? There's times it's saying, forget those things that are behind. And yet also the Bible's saying, uh, remove not the ancient landmarks or remember things in the past. I can assure you the Bible is not contradicting itself. First of all, the man that, was, that even uh, penned these words here in Philippians is Paul the Apostle. And I can tell you there was a lot about his life that he wanted to forget. And in fact, if he hadn't forgot about it, he would not have been a potent man of God. Would you agree? The man was a murderer. He was tr trashing the church, wasting the church. Um, in fact, he had to let go of his past in order that he would be spiritually effective. Um, it's the same for us. I do not need to remind you um, also what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back. Okay, it didn't end up pretty, okay? Um, it was devastating for her. I remember preaching a message, so I don't want, that's why I'm giving an introduction to this. I preached a sermon on Ruth and Orpah uh, a few years ago, and I called the danger of looking back in the day of trial. Okay? And, of course, we were talking about Ruth. In the day of trial, Ruth went forward, but Orpah, she looked back and she went back. Okay? So that's what the message was about um, then. One of the dangerous things about looking back is dwelling on our many bad choices, on our many failures. Would you agree? If we were all to start to look back at a lot of the things we've said, we've done, we've thought, we've felt, it's not pretty. The good news is when we come to Jesus, we spiritually do not have a past, we only have a future. Amen? Um, our past guilt, our shame is totally removed. Uh, but please remember, we only have a future because of the past. Um, does that make sense? We only have a future and a present because of the past. Uh, what Jesus did back in history allows us to have a bright future today. Um, we're told to remember in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24. It says, when, ye, when he had given thanks, he broke bread and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Um, after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Um, I can tell you this morning, the Lord does want us to look back, but only on one subject, to remember his goodness toward us. 
He also wants us to look back at the key moments in the past where he revealed himself or where he intervened and rescued us from our own folly. Amen? He wants us to remember that. He wants us to remember his faithfulness through the difficult times. I was encouraged in the prayer meeting, and it's amazing how many times my message is confirmed in the prayer meeting. Uh, Kyle was the first to pray this morning, and he starts off his prayer by saying this, We thank you, God, for your goodness, the goodness that you lavish upon us, and for the fact that you are a faithful father. And I'm like, that's exactly what I'm talking about this morning. When we look back, we look back at his goodness and we look back at his faithfulness. Amen? Um, you know, this is where a potent testimony arises. When you can move forward with great confidence because you know that God will care and provide because that has been your own experience over the years. You can look back to time after time after time Protection after protection after protection. Provision after provision after provision. And you find yourself now in a battle about to take a step. And you can say, I know. I know that he will be good. I know that he will be faithful because of my experience of God. I like what Solomon testified in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, at the dedication of the, the, the Old Testament temple. This is what he said. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. What a prayer. Amen. Solomon was acknowledging God's immense faithfulness in the past. He was confessing, when God says something, then that's it. That's it. The debating's over. You can go and ask people what they think of what God said, but it doesn't really matter what they say. God has said it, and he's going to keep it. It's written in stone, basically. The part that we do not tend to like is having to prove these promises by going through the trial. Because the only way you're going to have to prove some of these promises is actually go through trials and actually say that it's true. The way he was to them back in the day is the way that he is to, for me today. Because I've proved him. I have proved him. But to prove him, you must go through the trial. You must go through the suffering and the pain that goes with, with that. There are things that we're exhorted in Scripture to forget. And there are things we are exhorted to remember. And we need to get the balance right or else we could end up going down the wrong track. Um, what we are meant to forget in life is our own failures and our own hurts. But what we are meant to remember is the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. Sadly, people get it all the opposite way around. Um, they tend to focus on all the negative stuff that has happened in the past. Oh, well, I, I messed up there. So who am I to even pray in church? I feel God. I stumbled. I said that I would never do this, and I did it. And we start to look back, and we, we remember the things we're meant to forget. But then we also forget the things that we're meant to remember. There's something within human nature um, that seems to want to go in the wrong direction. Would you agree with me? And then we wonder why we're in defeat. We wonder why we're discouraged. We wonder why we're depressed. <coughs> Could I suggest to you, we're remembering the wrong things and we're forgetting the right things. The children of Israel had a bad habit of getting this whole thing back to front. Would you agree? Have you ever... Have you ever been reading the children of Israel and like God's blessing them and then a few chapters later like they're like they're blaming God, they're pointing the finger, they're murmuring, they're like and God's not liking that. In Psalm 78 40 it says this How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? 
Yes, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Listen to this. They remembered not his hand, nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy, how he had wrought his signs in Egypt. Brother, sister, sometimes this is our story. We're forgetful. We are forgetful for what he has done for us. Do you know the greatest thing that he's done for us? He dragged us out of a horrible pit. The, the Old Testament testimony says he, he dug us from the dunghill. Uh, just for information, the dunghill is the lowest form of refuge. Rivan's here this morning and he knows what refuge is. Well, the Bible says that God dug us from the dunghill. That's a sanitized way of talking about it. Hello? We were in a stinky mess. If that's all he's done for you, then you are qualified today to be thankful. Amen? Amen. And what God said here in Psalm 78 should be a solemn reminder to us this morning that we need to keep track of what God has done in our lives, individually and collectively. Once we forget that, we then stop giving him thanks. We lose sight of him. And once that happens, then we begin to doubt his ability to do the miraculous today and also tomorrow. Brother, sister, are you hearing me this morning? When we forget about what he has done for us in the past, then we start to lose hope for today and tomorrow. Then we start to murmur and complain. Then we start to focus on the wrong things. And before we know it, we've lost our joy and we've lost our peace. And we've lost our confidence. Bill can go into surgery tomorrow with a confidence because he's proved his God to be faithful. His God is good. His God is faithful. Thank God we don't have one of those gods with a big legalistic stick. Okay, so you did this yesterday, so I'm going to do this today. Thank God he doesn't give us what we deserve. If he give us what we deserved, do you think you'd be alive today? Do you think he, you would have a heartbeat? You know, even the wicked... Even the wicked today are the recipients of the grace of God. His common grace. Um, John Calvin called it common grace. The fact that they're alive today is God's grace. Amen? Back in the day, I've shared this story before. In London, there was a preacher uh, uh, preaching at Trafalgar Square, I believe it was. He was preaching the gospel. And there was hundreds round listening to the gospel. That was in a day where people wanted to hear the truth. Of course, this atheist come up. He was a loudmouth. He starts to shout down the preacher. And he starts to challenge. He says, there's no such thing as God. God's not real. I'll prove to you that God's not real. And he stood and he got up onto the platform. He says, if God's real, strike me dead right now. Nothing happened. He says, there's proof. There's proof to every one of you that this preacher is a liar. He's a liar. God doesn't exist. You've been deceived. You've been tricked by this lie. The preacher graciously come up to the microphone. He says, sir, you've just proved one thing. And that is that God's a gracious God. That's all you've proved today. Because if he give you what you deserve, you would be dead right away. But he's given you another opportunity to repent. Amen? Amen? It's time for the people of God to be bold. The Bible says we're not a timid people. Amen? He has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen? Um, so what is a memorial? What is a memorial? It's a reminder. Amen? It's a reminder. Most of us are familiar with uh, memorials. In fact, wherever you go in the world, um, in every nation, there tends to be um, memorials to remember great men and great women, uh, great events or great sacrifices, especially in wars. Amen? 
I mean, you go to Ireland, there's memorials everywhere. You go to France, there's memorials everywhere. You go to Ukraine, there's memorials, the ones that are still standing. And in America, throughout this land, there's memorials everywhere. Um, if you go to Washington, D.C., you will see the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, you'll see the Washington Memorial. Um, you'll see the grave of the unknown soldier and many other memorials in our nation's capital. Um, these memorials are there to remind us of the rich heritage that we have in this nation. So what is a spiritual memorial in Scripture? It's a reminder. In the Old Testament, um, it was often a pile of stones that was heaped together or a big ginormous stone that was set upright in a place as a reminder to everybody whenever they passed by, they were reminded that here God was good. God was faithful. Every time they went past those stones every day, it was a reminder to them. A reminder of what? A reminder of God's character. These brought their attention to the fact of God's favor, God's faithfulness, His goodness in the past. Um, they also reminded them that God doesn't change. Our God is an unchanging God. He blessed, He is blessing, and He will bless. Amen? Um, Hosea, the prophet, talked about Jacob in Hosea 12, verses 5 and 6. And this is what Hosea said. The Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his Jacob's memorial. Therefore, turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. God is our memorial. When we remember him, we feel good. Amen? Amen? When God is actually your memorial or your remembrance, then everything else falls into place. Everything. Uh, you have a solid foundation to build your hope upon. You have a great perspective of life. Isaiah 46, 9 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. It's important to look back as long as you're meditating on the right thing. It should not be past failures because they're covered. It should not be past hurts because they should be healed. It should rather be the goodness and the faithfulness of God toward you because they are ongoing. That is ongoing. As the song goes, and maybe Jan Huffman might remember this, Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. Who remembers that old song? Rita. Wow. Rita, would you come up and sing that? <laughs> you see, I've also uh, realized sometimes when I ask the question to God, there's kind of a lot of people remember, but they don't want to be asked to come up and sing it. <laughs> okay. We'll need to bring that song back, Rita. Huh? That's a very... Um, it's one of those old Pentecostal songs where everybody clapped their hands and, and the, the old deer started to dance and there was life. Amen? You know, there's numerous examples of God's people making memorials, numerous, uh, in their journey through life. One of these was actually when the children of Israel went over the River Jordan to go into the Promised Land. Remember the... The sea was there, the, 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 the river was there. They had to go across that. And it says in Joshua chapter 4, 7, The waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of, of the Jordan, 
as the Lord spoke unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and led them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which bore the ark of the covenant, stood. And they are there unto this day. I wonder if we were able to scuba dive today and go there. I mean, I wonder, are they still there today? They could be. Cyril Barber, historian, points out that two memorials were set up. The one at Gilgal and the other in the River Jordan. The memorial at Gilgal commemorated what happened and the memorial in the River Jordan commemorated where it happened. Um, by the way, you'll find proof of that in Joshua chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, if you want to check up on that. These stones that the children of Israel put in the, in the middle of the River Jordan were a remembrance. In fact, they were a permanent national remembrance. Um, and they were there for future generations so that they could point to their kids and, and their grandkids and say, look what the Lord has done. Joshua's stones of remembrance were just one monument in a series of memorials commemorating the mighty acts of God on behalf of his people. Years after it, the parents, the grandparents, could talk about it when a child would see a pile of stones at the top of a hill or in a field or beside a river or whatever. And they say, what does that represent, Daddy? What's that big stone sitting upright? What does that represent? He would tell him that that was there where such and such a person had a supernatural encounter with God. Or that is where God revealed himself to Israel. Or that is where God defeated Israel's enemies. Everywhere they went, there was reminder after reminder of the goodness and the power and the faithfulness of God. Or it could have been, that's where daddy had an encounter with God. Maybe he would take him down his own fields and take him to the bottom of the, where there was a creek. And there was a memorial. He said, this is where I met God. Son, this is where I met God. And then he would tell his story. I think today we've forgot we forgot about to put memorials. And I'm not just talking about stones. I'm talking about something greater. Deuteronomy 32.7 says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. You know, we have to pass on to the generation and the generations coming, how faithful God has been to us. Memorials were so important in reminding Israel what God indeed done. Our main reading this morning uh, talks about Samuel taking a stone and setting it up, and he named that stone Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. He set the stone up, and a lot of the times, which I find interesting, they actually give the, the piles of stone or the stone a name. You know, you, people think you're crazy today if you give your car a name or something. <laughs> you know, um, I think my mom had a nickname for her car. She's old Maggie still going, or like that there. So, you know, <laughs> you think that's crazy, like people, people are crazy, you know, like that. But, but you know what? God knows we're crazy. And whenever they built a stone, they would give it a name. See, there's Ebenezer just faithfully standing there. But that was, that was to represent something. Does that make sense? Um, so why all these memorials? Why was there so many memorials? Because we forget so easily. Would you agree? We forget so easily. Pastor David Campbell puts it like this. The purpose of the stone was to commemorate the Lord's goodness and faithfulness to his people over many generations. It served at once to give glory to God and needed 
and give encouragement to the people of God. The hymn writer refers to this in Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And the verse goes like this, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hitherto by God's help have I come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. God's past works should bring comfort to us today and give us a confidence and a hope for tomorrow. Dr. W. A. Criswell, who I believe was one of the leaders of the Southern Baptist movement back maybe about 30, 40 years ago, said this. That little word, hitherto, links the past to the present to the future and with the great sweep of its meaning, binds all history and all our lives into the hands and into the presence and before the face of God. He says, Hitherto, 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 hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Hitherto refers to the past. The disciples, by the way, were very familiar with this old covenant tradition. Um, they knew about the setting up of the memorials. So some of you remember in Matthew 17, where the Lord took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, there Christ was transfigured in front of them. There they met Moses and Elijah. That must have been an incredible moment. Amen? And what did Peter think when that happened? What did Peter want to do? It says in, in Matthew 17, 4, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Well, at least he mentioned the Lord first. Huh? <laughs> but what happened as soon as he said that? Peter was rebuked directly from heaven. The father actually rebuked him. And came to Christ's defense. You know, Elijah and Moses may have been faithful servants of God. But brother, sister, that's not what we remember. We remember him. Um, this was not, you know, let me tell you something. Even if you do every single thing that God calls you to do, you know what the Bible says? You're still an unprofitable servant, which is basically, compared to him, what we do is minuscule. That's why when we look back, we're not looking back to how great this, this man was or that man was. It's how great God was in that man. And God rebukes Peter. He says, you want to have a memorial for the three of them? This is all about Jesus. This is all about him. And that, that event that happened 2,000 years ago, um, it's a reminder for us as well today that Jesus Christ should be the daily focus for us. He should be the means of our comfort and our inspiration for tomorrow. He should be the topic of our conversation. He should be our purpose for living. That is the greatest memorial that you and me can build in this life. We don't have to build a pile of stones today. We don't have to get one big stone and set it up to remind us that we should remind each other every day. When we meet someone, when I bump into Jesse every day, I'm just encouraged because he is a walking memorial that God's still supernaturally working. God wonderfully touched him a few months ago. Well, he doesn't need to build a big pile of stones in his lawn in front of his house to, for us to be remembered how good God is. Amen? It's not about him. It's about the God that's working in him and through him. Does Jesse fall short? Yes. Does his God fall short? No. Does that make sense? We are walking memorials today. There's nowhere in the New Testament that says when God does a supernatural thing, you need to build the, these stones in front of your house. We don't need to do that. But when people go into the workplace and encounter you on a Monday morning, 
They should be seen a memorial to the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Amen. We are walking memorials today. We're walking monuments to the fact that God is who he says he is. Does that make sense? For the genuine Christian, one of the best ways to deal with current trials is by reminding ourselves of past trials, how he came through. Now, I'm not talking about med meditating upon how you dealt with the trial. Um, sometimes when we meditate upon how we dealt with the trial, it's sometimes pitiful. I talked to um, my brother-in-law, Vincent, yesterday. And... Their house um, was hit, a tornado come through Panama City, it's Panama City um, on Friday. It, um, their property was part of one of them that got hit by lightning. What happened was they were in the house and the lightning hit the, um, the electric uh, poles and wires. And of course, then they fell over onto their house and their house was set on fire. And... It was terrible, he said. He said that he said the whole house was electrified and they're in it. He says, that, you know, if they touched in, there was just a jolt of electric through them and the roof's on fire and the house is burning. And, um, and he said he went outside and he didn't have anything on his feet. And he says his whole body was just jolted. And then he's shouting to the neighbor and his wife who's inside and they couldn't hear him because of the noise and the, the drain pipes and all were metal. And he says they were just all like sparking and everything was... And he said it was unbelievable. And he said it took him back to a few years ago um, to when that hurricane, what, what was it, Hurricane Michael? Hurricane Michael hit, hit that place a few years ago and a lot of us went down uh, on a mission trip down there. And he said, you know, I look back a few years ago, he said, and he says, he says I didn't really deal with Hurricane Michael really good. They had a tree fell on the house and whatever. And he said it really unsettled him in his faith. But he says, you know, that experience really helped me because God really looked after us back with Hurricane Michael. And he says, you know, today, he says it's, it's devastating because a lot of the house was burned, but the fire department was able to save the house. Um, he says, but you know, today, which was yesterday, he says, you know, I look back and I take comfort from what happened a few years ago because God was faithful then and I know he's going to be faithful now. He said he preserved our house. I mean, there, even the electrics in the house are still working after that. Like the wire is actually on the house. He says two of the neighbor's houses were completely destroyed. Completely destroyed. He says, but he says the past experience my past experience of God, he says, and then I told him what I was preaching on today. And he kind of smiled and laughed. And he's, um, So sometimes we look at the past and we curse the past. But if we can only see God in our past, I can tell you what, maybe we would be slower to open up our mouth and, and curse the past. Your thinking and my thinking should be this. I trust you now because you have brought me through similar circumstances like this before even though it looked grim at the time. Can I say that once more? I believe that this should be our thinking. This should be our prayer right now, today. I trust you now, Lord. I trust you. Because you've brought me through similar circumstances to what I'm actually going through at the moment even though it looked grim at the time. I'll give you a scripture to support that. Ecclesiastes 1.9 The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, is that which shall be done. There is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. The way Jesus was yesterday, is the way he's going to be today. Is the way that he's going to be tomorrow. Amen? He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's where our comfort lies. If you know that, then it doesn't matter what you're going through this morning. You are going to feel good. 
Because your God is good, you're going to feel good. He was faithful, he is faithful, and he will be faithful. You say, well, you don't know what my family's going through. You don't know, like, what's going on around me. It just looks bleak, impossible. Whoa. Nothing is impossible to God. He's the one that saves your family, not you. You have to just come and say, Lord, there's nothing I can do. You're the one that does it. I'm handing it over to you. You've proved yourself to be faithful throughout my life, throughout the life of my parents, my grandparents. You're going to be faithful with me, my children, and my grandchildren. In fact, to the third and the fourth generation. Do you believe that? You can claim it. You can stand. We sang about standing on the promises of God this morning. Pastor McCollum says, don't be, it doesn't say we're sitting in the premises, we're standing on the promises, he said. Each one of you that has been on this Christian road for any amount of time should have numerous spiritual memorials or reminders of God's favor toward you toward your family and toward this church. But here's what I really feel stirred of the Lord to challenge you with this morning. Are you sharing that with others? Look what the Lord has done. I feel one of the indictments on this generation is the fact that even though each one of us have testimonies of multiple interventions of God in our life, multiple encounters, multiple blessings, we talk so little about it today. We want to talk about everything apart from what, look what the Lord has done. Are you with me? Our conversation, sometimes as families, as a church family, we need to remind ourselves, look what he's brought us through. That which is done is that which shall be done. He's preserved this church through a lot of arrows, a lot of obstacles, a lot of curses. There's been multiple curses put upon us. But you know what God says? You can't curse what God blesses. There's people freaked out and say, oh, this witch has put a curse on our church or this witch has put a curse on, on this leader or whatever. They have no power apart from what God gives them. That's it. If God says, if God curses, in fact, a lot of time the curse goes back on them. We don't hear that part. I remember in Sioux City, there used to be, used to like going up to, I think that there's a park in Sioux City, it's way up high, I think it's Bacon Creek or something. Mm -hmm. And I used to always like going up to that park, it was beautiful. But on the way up there, there was always this, one of these, um, it begins with P, what do you call it, these um, people that do all the EBGB stuff? Huh? A psychic. On the way up, on the right hand side, there was always like this psychic place. And it used to just get under my skin. Like it used to unsettle me every time I went past it. So every time I used to go past it, I used to just curse it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I curse that place in your name. Uh, and I wouldn't always do it audible because my wife and kids would have thought I was going to. But I used to say, Lord, just, just close that place, Lord. And then about a year later, I went up and it was, it was closed. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I can go up to Bacon Creek now and I don't need to look at that junk. Amen. But they can't do that to us because they have zero power over us. See, we have power over their devils. They have no power over our God. So it doesn't matter whether there's 10 million people out there today trying to curse you, curse your family. And you know, people say, oh, I heard there's a witch's coven up in the hills and they're praying against this church and whatever. And I'm like, and? And? Like, who are they? Huh? 
Who are they compared to our God? You want to focus on that? You'll start to get freaked out. You start to then lift your eyes just a little bit higher. And then it's like, yes, God, you've got it under control. Just send all their prayers and their curses back on themselves because we're not receiving it. Wrong address. Huh? Send it back. I don't know what you put on the, the post. Cindy, whenever somebody sends it to the wrong address, return to sender. Okay, return to sender. Take your curse. I don't want it. I'm not receiving it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I'm not going to get anxious about it. Return to sender. You see, no one can put a curse on you. Nobody can put a curse on you. What you receive is what you believe is what you become. But you have to go, no, wrong house, go. And if somebody comes into your house and tries to put a curse over you or whatever, or you're a Bible basher and you're this, nope, that's not right. Brother, sister, we have so much to thank the Lord for. If it's only one thing today, we should say to somebody, whether we're on social media, whether we encounter somebody today on our travels, just let them know the goodness of God in our life. That's the greatest memorial we can do in this New Testament era. Let us pray. I want to ask everyone in this house this morning. I want you to be brutally honest this morning. Are you remembering the things you should be forgetting and forgetting the things you should be remembering? Or are you remembering the things you should remember and forgetting the th things that you're meant to forget? You know, it's real, real easy to to just get caught up with the wrong thing. It's real easy. But there's only one thing that we should be meditating upon the past, and that is the goodness of God in our life. His faithfulness, His worthiness, His long-suffering upon us. But do you share that with others? We're walking memorials. We're speaking memorials. Are you telling people, this is what the Lord did for me back then? Back then, here's another memorial. 17 years ago, yesterday, God did something beautiful in my life. He gave me a beautiful wife. And the result of that is three beautiful kids. I thank the Lord for that memorial. God was at that wedding. The presence of God showed up at that wedding. And the day after that wedding, Jen's daddy, who was devout Catholic, went to the altar and committed his life to Jesus Christ. The day after, so the day after is also a memorial. A memorial to the goodness of God. He answered a prayer. We were on our honeymoon and he's at the altar giving his life to Jesus. What a mighty faithful God, amen? amen. Brother, sister, please, even though it seems grim at the moment in your circumstance, please thank him for what he's done. And as you start to thank him for what he's done, you, you release God to bless you today and tomorrow. God can't bless complaining or murmuring or negativity, but he can bless thankfulness. Amen. Let us just pray. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, help us to be faithful walking memorials of you. Everywhere we go, Lord, throughout the world, even in Ukraine this morning, there's memorials to your goodness. There's memorials to your faithfulness. As the people of God are meeting today, despite the war, despite Putin, they're still, despite the devil, they're still worshiping you in the midst of suffering, O oh God. Lord, the devil cannot stop us. The devil cannot turn us around. The devil cannot have any say over our lives. We refuse to give him that. Lord, we give you full control. We give you full glory for everything you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.